Coming up on Discover Purdue, we'll meet the new executive director of Purdue's Alumni Association, see the new Dalk Alumni Center, we'll learn more about scholarship opportunities, and talk football with former Purdue players about their record-setting season. All that and more next from Purdue University on Discover Purdue. Discover Purdue. Hi, everybody. I'm Mike Pickett. This is my co-host, Tangra Brogy, And our guests on the program this week are the executive director of the Purdue Alumni Association, Todd Coleman, and three football players who enjoyed a lot of success in 2004. But first, here's Tangra with our first story. Thanks, Mike. Each week on this program, we bring you up to date on one of the many construction or renovation projects at Purdue. Today, Brandy Parisi has a report about one of those projects that is already finished. The Dick and Sandy Dowk Alumni Center was completed and dedicated within the last year after being funded entirely with private gifts. It is a $16 million building designed as a showcase for Purdue achievements and a home to the Purdue Alumni Association and University Development Office. Coming home now has a new meaning for Purdue alumni returning to campus. This is the first alumni center in the history of the university and is a definite source of pride for the more than 350,000 Boilermaker alumni. The building features a grand foyer highlighting the achievements and accomplishments of Purdue alumni and displaying many of the university's wonderful traditions. The building is located at the intersection of Wood and Grant Streets in West Lafayette and is open to the public Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Joining me now is Todd Coleman, the new executive director of the Purdue Alumni Association, which is one of the tenants in that beautiful new building we have just seen. Todd, welcome to our program. Thanks. It's great to be here. Tonight. Great to have you. Now, you are relatively new to Purdue, but uh, I understand you're not new to advancement. Tell us a little bit about where you've been and what brought you here. Actually, I've been in the advancement field, alumni relations, for 20 years now and uh, was at University of Missouri most recently for 10 years and the chance to come back home. I, I'm a native of Indiana and actually have a long Purdue history in my family. My dad was an extension agent and I attended Purdue. My brother's a graduate and uh, we have several other aunts and uncles and cousins and a whole bit that are also graduates of Purdue. So I uh, didn't have to relearn the fight song and I knew the streets of West Lafayette and I already had a lot of black and gold uh, in my wardrobe as well. Well, good, good, great. Now, tell us a little bit about some of your goals and initiatives uh, for the upcoming year with the association. We primarily want to continue to build off the tremendous enthusiasm that's happening here at, at Purdue and all the wonderful things that are happening and just engage more alumni in the life of Purdue. So we'll be looking for opportunities through our events, through our publications, uh, through the use of email, through just a variety of forms of, uh, of communication to just engage more people and let more people know about the exciting things that are happening here. Now, trying to engage uh, more alumni, how do you think that the new Alumni Center is going to help you help you do that? Well, it's a wonderful facility. I mean, we're having all kinds of people come by and visit the facility. It's a place for alumni to call home. Uh, it's also a place for alumni and residents, our current students, to understand more about the association and building lifelong relationships with the university. And so uh, it's, it's going to have a wonderful impact on us just involving more people. The number of events we're able to host there, the people that stop by on weekends or when they are making casual visits back to campus have been wonderful. And a lot of interactive uh, uh, opportunities as well, traditions, uh, learn more about the traditions of Purdue and some of the exciting things that are happening here. That's great. Now, um, one of the things uh, um, that's really been going on here on campus has obviously been the campaign for Purdue. It's yes. been enormously successful. Um, how do you feel that um, alumni and the Alumni Association have helped contribute to that success? Well, I think primarily, again, the Alumni Association's role is to just engage more people in the university. And the more people we can get engaged 
and learning about what's happening here and getting exciting about the happening here. Ultimately, it'll, it'll lead to uh, people making a gift to the institution. So the more people we can get involved in the campaign, the more alumni that can become involved in the campaign is a direct result of, of our work and the Alumni Association of keeping them, either keeping them involved after graduation or getting them reconnected at some point in time in their lives. Now, the, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, the Alumni Center is, um, I'm sorry, the Alumni Association is uh, very vast. I understand you have more than 69,000 members. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of members, but yes. I understand you're taking some steps to increase those numbers. Uh, how, are you, how are you doing that? Well, we're going to do a lot more of, of what I call affinity uh, marketing. We're going to really drill down into a person's undergraduate experience and find out the things that were most meaningful to them. Um, as Purdue has grown and, we've, and our class sizes have grown, class year has become less and less of, of a factor for folks and more and more what is of interest to people is the particular organization they were involved in, the particular department they were in, or the particular professor that they have. So we're doing a lot of background work to collect data so we're able to drill down and do a little more of a one-on-one -on -one kind of marketing approach and really appeal people down to where they spend a majority of their time which is in a residence hall, in a fraternity, a sorority, in a student organization. Uh, and really and really trying to appeal to them and get them connected back through that avenue rather than this much broader kind of uh, more uh, generic kind of focused approach. Right, <clears throat> right. What are some of the benefits um, of being a member of the association? Well, there's a variety of different benefits. One of being a member is one, you'll get the magazine six times a year and through the surveying we show that that is, is the number one per benefit of, of being a member. So the magazine goes out six times a year. All the events that we do, although we invite all alumni to events, we also, uh, uh, if you're a member, you're going to pay a little bit less to attend those events. Uh, we've tried to come up with a, a benefits package that offer insurance programs to new graduates or uh, we have a university credit card where people can carry a card that has a university logo on it. Uh, we try and do a number of events that, that somehow show back we're benefiting, their membership dollars are benefiting the university, um, providing faculty incentive grants to, to, to faculty on campus. Student scholarships is a big part of our club program, uh, is providing scholarships to students. So there's a variety of different things and every member kind of joins for, for a different reason. Some join because of the monetary benefits we can provide and many join because they just want to show their support for Purdue. And how can an interested uh, viewer today, how can they find out how to become a member? The uh, easiest way would be to visit our website, uh, www.purdue.edu slash PAA, and you can get on there and be able to see that we have over 120 clubs around the country. Uh, every school and college has an alumni organization, and just see the variety of benefits and, and other things that we offer to our alumni members and to alumni as a whole. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. Wish you the best of luck. Thank you very thank much. You. Now, our trivia question for today also deals with Purdue alumni. Here it is. Which of the following famous alums have had a building at Purdue named in their honor? Is it A, basketball coaching legend John Wooden, B, C-SPAN founder Brian Lamb, or C, NASA astronaut Neil Armstrong? If you're watching last week's program, we basically gave you the answer already, but we'll be back later in the program with the correct answer. Mike will return after this. What if there were a place where people still believe they can change the world? Where creativity guides technology and where ideas are created and challenged every single day? What if there were a place where finding the answers is just the beginning? That place is Purdue. It's here. Opportunities for scholarships at Purdue have increased considerably in recent years, including a program which selects one deserving high school student from each county of Indiana. Here's Brandy Parisi. Purdue University began a new scholarship program in fall 2004 that focuses on Indiana students who've endured personal hardships as well as high financial need. The Opportunity Award program was initiated by Purdue President Martin Jiski. There are young people in every county of Indiana who are well qualified to study at Purdue, but obstacles stand in the way. We are sweeping these obstacles away by offering a privately funded Purdue Opportunity Award 
to one student from every county in the state every year. This program provides a total financial aid package for one year and additional support for a second year. Program coordinator Sarah Helm says the recipients gather monthly for social activities and to learn how to succeed in college. The more that you can stay on top of things as you're going through the more that can eliminate the cramming situation. We really work very hard for them to feel welcome and connected here to Purdue University and also give them opportunities to start building relationships with one another and make lifelong friendships. All the nights free. The scholars have faced a variety of difficulties in their young lives. Some students have uh, battled the hardship of being in a single parent family. Many of these students worked three or four jobs in addition to going to high school full time. A lot of these students have either had a very sick parent or sibling in which they might have had to help take care of. Uh, perhaps even that parent and sibling passed away. Brittany Shively's mother died during childbirth, leaving her to help raise two younger siblings. I definitely think it's made me a stronger person. It forced me to grow up a little bit faster and realize what the important things are in life and what I really needed to focus on. And it's made me want to do even better in school because I know that's what she would have wanted me to do. <laughs> Tung Ho struggled with learning English when he and his mother first got here from Vietnam. When he was in high school, his mother was injured in a car accident. She had two surgeries on her elbow and arm, so I had to take care of a lot of medical documents and uh, take her to a doctor. Tung says the scholarship has allowed him to focus on his studies rather than financial worries. And it also provides you a feeling that there's someone there for you and someone cares. But in what other ways might you want to get at the data? While growing up, Darren Hines and his sister had to cope with their mother suffering from schizophrenia. She was really sick, like while she had schizophrenia, so we had to take care of her, make sure that she took her medicine, make sure she went to the doctor. Thank you've already done that. All of the Opportunity Award recipients are extremely grateful. I wouldn't have thought that I had a chance to go to college without this award at least at Purdue. Had I not gotten the scholarship, it probably would have been a lot harder for me to come, and I may actually have had to wait a year and then come. Starting in fall 2005, recipients will get the additional benefit of having past recipients serve as their mentors. We want to give the recipients next fall an opportunity to really have that mentor in their lives to help and guide them and give them support throughout their first year. The Purdue Opportunity Awards are designed to change lives forever and for the better. The Purdue Opportunity Awards are designed to help dreams come true. Two of Purdue's most successful football players ever, Taylor Stubblefield and Kyle Orton, closed out their careers in the Sun Bowl on December 31st. And before they left campus, I had a chance to talk with them about their record-setting careers. Two of the great football careers in Purdue University history are wrapping up. Kyle Orton and Taylor Stubblefield. Can you think back and imagine that uh, it's all over now? Is it, can you, is it really exciting to you to think back of what's happened here? Yeah, it's real exciting. You know, I think I had a good career here and just looking back at all the fond memories, you know, it's all coming to an end here in a little bit. Taylor, when you were recruited and you, you looked around the country at different schools, you picked Purdue. Is this what you expected? Was it the career you've been to a record-setting career? Uh, I don't think I expected this. I expected to have fun and expe expected to win and do good, but uh, you know, I don't think uh, expected to do as well of, as well as we've done. What about Purdue as a place to have, have uh, staged your college career? Is it what you had hoped it would be, or more? Yeah, it's definitely more than what I had hoped it to be, and it's it's turned out real good for me. I've uh, made great friendships um, and uh, been a part of a great football team. You two uh, are probably the best, if not one of the best, passing combinations that this university has seen. Tell us about that. What's, uh, what, what kind of relationship have you developed over your careers here? Uh, we've developed a good relationship on and off the football field, but you know we've been together for four years now, so uh, you know kind of know each other's moves. How about that? Is that is that pretty much how you feel? You guys work uh, just like you're kind of like the Manning and Harrison combination? Yeah, it's definitely the moves on the field. And uh, not as I don't know his moves off the field, <laughs> but uh, you know he, he he's done a lot uh, you know for me and uh, he we work well together together you know he's thrown uh, pretty good balls and I've had to catch uh, 
pretty good balls, and you know he, he's done a great job for me. And hopefully, you know people do, will remember us and, and the teams that we've been a part of. You know, Tang, you're a national champion receiver, a record holder, and yet uh, when you started out your career, you weren't catching many of his TD passes, and all of a sudden, uh, seems like uh, every third one was going in the end zone. What's, what was different? Well, you know, I, I tried to take him out to McDonald's after my first year, and then I, I realized that wasn't working, so I moved it up. You know, I moved it up to Applebee's, and then after that I had to go to Sarge Oaks and then Trails and stuff like that. So I think that's what really made it happen for me to start getting some touches. Is that right? Which yeah. one of those restaurants was, the, was your favorite? What really turned the tide? Uh, I think it was just, uh, you know, McDonald's. He started buying me apple pies for desserts. That's what <laughs> did it. That, that's what did it. You're, you're almost working for a legendary, almost coach at Purdue in, in Joe Tiller. What? What's it really like being uh, one of Teller's guys? Uh, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun in practice. We have a lot of fun uh, in meetings and, and just, uh, you know, he's, he's got a dry sense of humor, but something that a Midwestern guy like myself can really uh, relate to. How, how do you get along with this coach? He's, uh, he, he's somebody special, but he speaks his mind. Yes, he definitely speaks his mind. <laughs> um, he is a, like you said, dry sense of humor guy. And me coming from the West Coast, sometimes he might not be able to understand my uh, sense of humor. No, he doesn't always appreciate it. Yeah, he doesn't appreciate. It. No, he's he's a great coach, and like you said, he's going to be legendary here. And um, uh, you know, so it might be the Tiller Field here in a little while. Let's let's talk if we can about about your careers, Kyle. What think about a high point? What where what was the peak? When did you think, man, this is it? Uh, probably the win up at Notre Dame this year. Uh, you know, we were really clicking and just played great football, and everything was going good for us then. So uh, that's probably my high point in my career. How about you, Taylor? When, what's the big moment? Yeah, definitely as a team aspect, uh, um, our, our win or our five-game win streak, um, and especially the, the win up at Notre Dame. We played well national TV every other every week, and, and we performed well. Where you know, um, you know, Kyle was at the top of the Heisman list, and he, he he was throwing great. Our team was doing great. You know, that's definitely the high point in our career. Thanks to Kyle and Taylor, we wish them much success at the next level. And speaking of success at the next level, how about the season former Purdue quarterback Drew Brees had with the San Diego Chargers? Videographer Ray Coverly caught up with Drew in Indianapolis a few weeks ago and files this report. Less than a year ago, the San Diego Chargers management had all but given up on quarterback Drew Brees. He had thrown more interceptions than touchdown passes and was blamed, criticized, and even benched while the team was losing 12 of its 16 games. Management used his first-round draft pick to bring in another quarterback and signed him to a $40 million contract. Breeze appeared to be on his way out. But the former Maxwell Trophy winner and two-time Heisman finalist, who led Purdue to its first Rose Bowl in 34 years in 2001, had other ideas. But the big thing, it was just an attitude, you know? It was like, well, hey, what am I going to do? Am I going to sit around and let somebody take my job, or am I going to show them what I'm all about? So I decided to show them what I'm all about. I think last year was just something that it's one of those seasons you have to go through in order to make yourself a better player and a better person. And I think we all grew and, and learned and matured and learned from that time. And you know, honestly, going to, coming into the season, we expected to be in the position we are right now. We expect to be going to the playoffs and fighting for a Super Bowl championship. We're not surprised with where we are right now, but we understand. You know, we still have a lot of work ahead of us, and just got to keep going. Drew led the Chargers to an amazing turnaround in 2004 with a 12 and 4 record, a divisional championship a playoff appearance for the first time in nine years, and a near upset of the Indianapolis Colts in the RCA Dome. His head coach, Marty Schottenheimer, was impressed. He's um, a remarkable competitor and um, has provided great leadership as well as great performance for us this year. There were moments that I thought it was Peyton Manning. I mean, it was like Peyton does. You know, he comes up and he patient and that clock is going down to five for them are we going to get the boom the ball gets snapped i mean it was terrific breeze was named to the all pro team and is the nfl comeback player of the year for 2004 finishing with nearly 3500 yards passing for 29 touchdowns against just nine interceptions and completing nearly two-thirds of his passes running back ladanian tomlinson praises his teammate he spent countless hours, you know, in the film room, um, out there on the football field um, with his receivers and, you know, getting that timing down. 
you know, getting a, a really uh, special bond that they're building together. He spent countless hours like that in the off season. Um, so I think just, you know, that has paid off for him. I always had confidence in Drew. You know, I've been I've been uh, behind him, you know, forever, you know, since we got here. So I always had the confidence in him. It was no doubt in my mind that if he put his mind to it, he would be, be starting at this point in time. And speaking of past Boilermakers leads us to our next story. Just how did Purdue get its nickname? Associate Athletics Director Jay Cooperwriter has the answer. Boilermakers, as unique a nickname as you'll find for a sports team in university. For more than a century, the name has been attached to Purdue sports teams. And by extension, anyone who bleeds black and old gold likes to be known as a Boilermaker. But where did the name come from? One dictionary definition is a combination of beer and whiskey. The other, a worker who makes, assembles, or repairs boilers. Our research points to the latter. Football took hold at Purdue in 1887, when Purdue played one game, a loss to Butler. By 1891, Purdue had begun administering blistering defeats to Wabash College, DePauw, Butler, and most other teams it played. This success prompted more than a bit of name calling, and that's how the Boilermakers got their name. Most people have heard the traditional tale of the birth of the Boilermakers. It goes that Purdue defeated Wabash College in 1889 and that local newspapers in Crawfordsville didn't take the defeat well. Another version of the origin of the Boilermakers states that in the late 1880s, workers from the Monon shops in Lafayette were recruited to beef up the Purdue team. Both of those versions are mistaken. You see, the maintenance shops of the Monon Railroad, the remnants of which are behind me on Lafayette's north side, weren't even in operation until 1895. And that was several years after the Purdue football team was being called Boilermakers in newspaper accounts. Our research shows that part of the explanation is right that it came in the form of a newspaper account of a Purdue Wabash game. But it wasn't in 1889, as the traditional story claims. That year, Purdue defeated Wabash 18 to four, and the Crawfordsville papers were something less than congratulatory toward the visiting victors. Back then, newspapers took sides and took great pride in standing by the home team and sticking it to the visitors. Witness these words from a November 1889 edition of the Crawfordsville Review. Wabash was defeated, not in a game of football played with science, but by slugging. And as they do not profess to be sluggers, rail splitters, hayseeds, and pumpkin shuckers, they give up with good grace. This is the newspaper article generally credited with first applying the label Boilermakers. But there's one problem with that. The term Boilermaker is nowhere to be found in the article. As we inspected newspaper accounts of Purdue football games after the 1889 victory over Wabash, we found the name began showing up everywhere late in the 1891 season and into 1892. One particular account in the Lafayette Sunday Times of early November 1891 gave us a singular clue. The story, in a rather taunting tone, told of Crawfordsville newspaper coverage of the Purdue Wabash game of the week before. It went, as everyone knows, Purdue went down to Wabash last Saturday and defeated their 11. The Crawfordsville papers have not yet gotten over it. The only recourse they have is to claim that we beat their scientific men by brute force. Our players are characterized as coal heavers, boilermakers, and stevedores. The week before, the Crawfordsville Daily Journal reported, those big fellows from Purdue know how to play football as well as pound rivets into boilers and will easily walk away with the state championship. Another Crawfordsville paper, the Argus News, described, quote, the game between the Herculean wearers of the black and gold and the light though plucky supporters of the crimson. That account appeared beneath a headline that ended our search for the birth of the Purdue nickname. Under the words, slaughter of innocence, the Argus News told its readers that Wabash College was snowed completely under by the burly boilermakers from Purdue. We infer from this treatment that the unique term indeed first showed itself in the Crawfordsville Argus News in October 1891. 
And while this answer is part of the riddle of the birth of the Boilermakers, it only tells us the when and the who, but not the why. Part of the answer to why can be found in events on the Purdue campus that same fall of 1891. Just weeks before the Boilermakers earned their name, a locomotive arrived at West Lafayette that would forever change the course of education and research at Purdue. This was no express, though. It was the Schenectady, and the Purdue campus was the end of the line for the engine. By acquiring the Schenectady, Purdue cemented its reputation as an engineering school. But to partisans and backers of football opponents, arrival of the Schenectady no doubt reinforced the notion that Purdue was a railroad school where students learned to pound rivets into boilers. Purdue was and is a land-grant university. It was founded to train the sons and daughters of the working class. Wabash College, on the other hand, was and is known as Athens on the Wabash. Founded in 1832, Wabash was the institution where the highborn received a classical education. So in a way, the Boilermakers sobriquet hurled by that Crawfordsville newspaper in 1891 was as much a symptom of age-old class warfare as fierce boosterism. The moniker was offered as a put-down, but when all was said and done, it was accurate. Purdue, indeed, in the early 1890s, was training young men to be Boilermakers. So there you have it, the birth of the Boilermakers. It's a nickname rooted in the noble, sweaty work of the laborer, an insult hurled as a dying gasp by the backers of a vanquished foe. Finally, we asked you earlier in the program which of the following famous alums have had a building at Purdue named in his honor. Is it A, basketball coaching legend John Wooden, B, C-SPAN founder Brian Lamb, or is it C, NASA astronaut Neil Armstrong? Well, that should be pretty easy for anyone who watched last week's program. The answer is C, Neil Armstrong for whom the new Millennium Engineering Building will be named. Great to know. Thanks for joining us today, and make sure you tune in next week and every week through early April to discover Purdue. So long.